Good morning, church. It is good to be with you all. Um, let's begin the way we do. Let us offer one another the sign of peace, and the ways that we can do that is peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. And this morning, I don't have, I went back to a another order of worship, so I don't have my little prayer to bring you all back in. So um, we're just going to um, turn then when I look, when it looks like we've all completed our peace to one another, then I'll have you turn to me and you'll offer peace to me and I to you. Let us begin. And I say, peace be with you, and you say, and also with you. You may be seated. I'm Reverend Brenda Torrey, and I am the minister here at Emmanuel United Church, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I want to tell you something. I want to tell you that your presence here today changes things. It changes the world by the act of inviting God into your heart and into your thoughts and then back into your community. And we all say, Amen. Let us begin with our call to worship. God, you search me and know me. Before I sit, you know when I will rise. God, you search me and know me. Before I speak, you know that I will sit. God, you search me and know me in my joy and despair, in my breathing in and breathing out. God, you search me. God, search me and know me. Search me, O God, and know my heart on this wintry morn. And let us stand as we sing Voices United, number 603, in loving partnership we come. So this morning, Nancy was holding a little space for me there. Um, this morning, Mike, as we were putting our coats on, Mike, my husband, 
uh, came down with a migraine just as we were going to step out the door. So I lost my Sunday school teacher and my reader this morning in fell, one fell swoop. So I called Mary and I called Neil. And uh, so Sunday school is set up. Anybody wants to go to Sunday school instead of the sermon, I'm telling you, there's some great stuff to do in there. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you to Mary for graciously stepping in for us this morning. So, and, and thank you to Nancy for holding that space. So this week's psalm text, and it's Psalm 139, 1 through 18, um, is actually from the Lucan Psalter translation. And it brings home this message that we are in intimate relationship with God. There is nowhere we go that God is not present. No state of our being, I said that, no state of our being that results in our being abandoned. God has knit us together, has woven us, knowing us from before our beginning. God indeed is holding our lives. And I'll begin. Adonai, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O oh God, know it altogether. You press upon me behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high, I cannot attain it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uppermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. You created my inmost being and stitched me together in my mother's womb. For all these mysteries, I thank you. For the wonder of myself, for the wonder of your works, my soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you. While I was being made in that secret place, knitted together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my body even there. All of my days were written in your book, all of them planned before even the first of them came to be. How precious your thoughts are to me, Adonai. How impossible to number them. I could no more count them than I could count the sand. But suppose I could, you would still be with me. The Gospel lesson today is from John 1, verses 43 to 51, and this is a part where he's called Philip and Nathaniel to be disciples, or that they get called. The next day, Jesus wanted to go into Galilee, and he found Philip. Jesus said to him, follow me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathaniel and said to him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets. Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. Nathanael responded, can anything good come from uh, Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, here is a genuine Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. I assure you that you will see heaven open and angels going up to heaven and down to earth on the human one. Herein lies wisdom. Okay, Erica, come on over. 
And I'm, I'm thinking that there's probably some folks online too. You wanna sit here? Is that good? Okay. So today, the, the first reading that we heard, Erica, and good morning, and it's good to see you. Things like that happen, don't they, Erica? Sometimes we wanna do one thing and somebody else says we have to do another, right? You did, yeah. Sometimes fusses can get loud at home, can't they? We can get a little loud. Well, I'm hoping that Jamie and Brendan are online so that they can hear our story today, which is You Are Special by Max Lucado. Yeah, there it is. So we can all see the pictures while I read. And thanks to Steve Dixon, because this was a, a last night uh, fix for us. So are you ready, Erica? The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes, some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, other wore, others wore coats, but all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of gold star stickers and a box of gray dot stickers. Up and down the streets, all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint, always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented ones got stars too. Some could, some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others do big words or could sing pretty songs. And I bet some of them could dance like you, Erica. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. And every time they got a star, oh, it made them feel so good. It made them want to do something else and get another star. Do you see all those stars? Oh, a star on a tongue, that is funny. Others though could do little and they got dots. Punchinello was one of these, there he is. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around him and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. Then, when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly and the Wemmicks would give him more dots. After a while, he had so many dots that he didn't want to go outside. He was afraid he would do something silly, such as forget his hat or step in the water, and then people would give him another dot. In fact, Erica, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up and give him one for no reason at all. He deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. Oh, that's so sad, isn't it, Erica? The few times he went outside, he hung around other Wemmicks who had lots of dots. He felt better around them. One day he met a Wemmick who was unlike any he'd ever met. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucy Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. And some of the Wemmicks adored, um, admired Lucia for having no dots. So they would run up and give her a star but it would fall off. Can you imagine that? Others would look down on her for having no stars, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stay either. That's the way I want to, want to be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anyone's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day I go see Eli. Eli? 
Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill, he's there. And with that, the Wemmick who had no stickers turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me? Punchinello cried out. Will he want to see me? Lucia didn't hear. So Punchinello went home. He sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other stars and dots. Hmm, it's not right, he muttered to himself. Does it seem right? Giving stars and dots. And he decided to go see Eli. He walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped into the big shop. Oh my goodness. I'd be a little nervous going in there, would you maybe? feel nervous going in there on your own. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he. He had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was as long as his little arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. And he turned to leave. I think he might have been feeling a little nervous too. Then he heard his name, Punchinello. The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little women gasped. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up and set him on the bench. Hmm. The maker spoke thoughtfully as he looked at the gray dots. Looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself with me, child. I don't care what the other Wemmicks think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're Wemmicks, just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you are pretty special. Punchinello laughed. Me? <laughs> special? What are you thinking? Oh, is it a different picture? It's coming. Why? I can't walk fast. I can't jump. My paint is peeling. Why do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on those small wooden shoulders, and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. There it is. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no marks, said Punchinello. I know. She told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day and let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, said Eli as the Wemmick walked out the door, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. So Erica, do we know, and maybe the people up there can help us too, our, our people, do we know who loves us all the time? We can say it, yeah. You are gonna point to daddy, right? And mommy, and who else loves us all the time? Who do we come here to hear about? Mm -hmm. Oh, did it? Oh, that's interesting. Do you think maybe it was this? Maybe it was that page, huh? 
So we come here, everyone, do we come here? Erica, I know you know this answer. We come here to learn about God, right? So with God, God thinks we're special because God made us. And so God loves hanging out with us and praying is the way that we get to hang out with God. Praying, singing, dancing, doing those kinds of things. Okay, so let's have a little prayer and everyone can repeat after us. You ready, Erica? Okay. Dear God, help us to remember that we are always special. To you, help us remember how much you love us as we go about our day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you're ready. There's Daddy is ready for you. Okay, thanks, Erica. <laughs> Steve, we have a music video, right? It's hard. It's <laughs>
you, Erica. That was beautiful music, wasn't it, Erica? Mm -hmm. So our sermon title this morning is Something Good. My husband, Mike, is incredibly complimentary about my cooking. Whenever the smells emanating from the kitchen make it to him, he always says, something smells really good, Bren. And I remember when I was pregnant with our third baby, and I was here as a member of this congregation, I bought black dishware so that whatever I managed to cook looked appealing. It is nice to offer our best, even when we may be short on resources. And for me, I knew that resource was going to be time. I was running a home daycare, had a very busy seven and a half year old, and some of you may remember Ben. When he was younger, he would crawl under the church pews, <laughs> popping up to visit beloved Helen Hastelow. And then our daughter, Siobhan, who is a member here at Emmanuel and has the two little red-headed girls who dance along with Erica at the front on any given Sunday. And Siobhan was aged five, and, and then I'd have an infant. Still, I wanted to offer something good for us to eat. In our psalm, we are something good, something to be carefully tended, and I wonder, how did it feel to hear these words? Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, there you are. If I make the grave my bed, you are there also. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand hold me fast. If we could hold these words fast to our hearts every moment of every day, would we be different people, I wonder? Less afraid, less anxious, less panicked, more bold, more loving, more generous. I know I would be. Maybe every morning when we open our eyes, we ought to turn to Psalm 139. I think it would be like wrapping ourselves in a goose down comforter to begin the day. A little God armor against all of the slights, the injustices, the bothers that buzz around us like annoying flies as the day tumbles over us. We are so wondrously loved that God never lets us out of God's sight. I'll say it again. We are so wondrously loved that God never lets us out of God's sight. From before the moment we were born and even after this side of our journey is completed, when we are safely in the place Jesus has prepared for us. Like the psalm song sings, where can I go that God will not be? In the John reading, Nathaniel poses the question, can anything from Nazareth be good? <laughs> Ouch. In polite society, we'd, we'd consider Nathaniel's question rather rude. Notice, though, that Jesus does not store Nathaniel's question away hmm, to gorge on the offense for days or even years to come. Nope. Jesus, in Jesus' way, turns our response to the question on its head, finding Nathaniel refreshingly direct. And that's for another sermon. Nathaniel, for his part, is clearly surprised that this Jesus knows him. Well, Jesus at the least took note of Nathaniel sitting under the fig tree. I was speaking with my friend Susan the other evening about being curious about people. And I know that there are sermons where I've spoken about curiosity, and I think curiosity is good for us. Unless, maybe, you're a cat. <laughs> but seriously, I think wonder and curiosity go hand in hand. And as Susan astutely pointed out, 
wonder, we've just come through Christmas, through the Lent, the Advent season and, and, into, and into Christmas, wonder is truly biblical. It's all over the Bible. We read our scripture. The psalmist is filled with wonder at God's careful tending of him. And Nathaniel is filled with surprise and wonder that Jesus has seen him. And here's one for us. I wonder why Nathaniel was at the fig tree. And I'll, let, I'll leave some of you to chase that squirrel while the rest of us think on this. How many movies or even marriages are made out of love at first sight? How many of you believe in love at first sight? Really, how many of you believe in love at first sight? You can put up your hands, raise your hand. Oh, just a few of you, all right, okay. Maybe I should ask how many of you have experienced love at first sight? Okay, nice, a few of you. That's a curious thing. Seeing someone and knowing instantaneously that your heart has been cleaved open, your destiny is utterly and truly changed. So let's give a listen to a brief love at first sight story from a woman named Sue. My husband and I have been married for 19 years this past June, says Sue. We met through our mutual friend and still best friend, Howie, who was having a birthday party and wanted both of us to join him at the pub for a celebration. I saw Howie and my now husband, Dave, walking up to the dorm to meet me and all I could think at that moment was, I am in love. I am going to be with that man. She said, Dave and I had an instant connection, talked all night, and were best friends and soulmates for many years after. We each dated different people along the way, and finally, in our mid-20s, he made the move and explained that he had been in love with me from the start. It took a while for us to pull it together, but we have been best friends for almost 30 years and married for 19 of those. In the instant that Jesus told Nathaniel he saw him under that fig tree, Nathaniel's heart was cleaved open. His destiny is utterly and totally changed. Martin Luther King Jr. hoped for a day when we would see one another's content of character. And to help us get it straight, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We all see things differently. We read the book, You Are Special. Someone else passing by Nathaniel might have thought him unremarkable or may not even have taken notice of him at all. But Jesus immediately sensed the content of his character. Jesus can sniff out truth because, well, he is truth with a capital T. So in these times, I think we are really struggling over what is truth. According to the Associated Press, over 50 countries go to the polls in 2024. The year will test even the most robust democracies. And even here, the heart of the country is being cleaved open a little too far over truth, is it not? And whose truth to believe? Rachel Held Evans guides us with how Christian truth works. She says, an encounter with the gospel of Jesus, rather than propping us up, makes us uncomfortable, as tends to happen with anyone who is actually paying attention. And she and I both conclude with, myself included. Maybe we think we can't see the truth, but it sits firmly in the pages of the gospel. And it can, it can be a bit prickly for us. And even though it might be prickly, it can also help calm us, guide us, and give us hope toward a future we are often unsure of. 
And I like the treasure James Howell dug around to find in our John reading. He says, Jesus' clinching words intrigue. You will see heaven opened and angels ascending and descending. Jesus is alluding to Genesis 28, when Jacob was not praying or seeking God. He was on the run, anxious, exhausted, trying to sleep with a rock for his pillow. He dreams of traffic between heaven and earth, and he, when he wakes up stunned, he says, Surely the Lord was in this place, but I did not know it. Maybe Nathaniel and Philip thought the same thing. This is the spiritual life, not, not eyes closed in prayer, Bible open, kneeling at the altar, or singing a hymn. It is being out and about. And God was and is there, although you might realize it only in retrospect, says James. Like finding your love at first sight. Our psalm reassures, that, reassures us that God is always holding our life. Head of a Billy Graham Center, Ed Stetzer, shows us where we've gotten lost in the weeds. I think the scandal of the evangelical mind today, he says, is the gullibility that so many have been brought into. Conspiracy theories, false reports, and more. And so I think the Christian responsibility, did you hear that? And so I think the Christian responsibility is we need to engage in what we call in the tr Christian tradition, discipleship. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus literally identifies himself as the truth. Therefore, if there ever should be a people who care about the truth, it should be people who call themselves followers of Jesus. Like the widow who scours her cottage for a lost coin, we too ought to scrupulously search for the truth. Rachel Held Evans describes Jesus' truth for us. Sure, she says, the good news of safety, popularity, and political power is more appealing to us. But it's not the good news Jesus preached. Not by a long shot. No one ever said the fruit of the Spirit is money, success, or political power. Rather, the fruit of the Spirit is Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Qualities that can be found in all types of communities, be they conservative or liberal, evangelical or mainline Protestant, big or small. Like Jacob, many of us are fearful or anxious or exhausted. And some nights we may we feel that we've slept on a rock for a pillow. Let me reassure you, every Sunday we can climb into that goose down comforter stuffed with the memory of Psalm 139 when we worship together, be it in here or online together. God is in this place and every place we go God is in the scripture we read, the word we hear preached, and the prayers we pray. Well, I won't lie. The goose down comforter may not always make us feel comfortable. There may be a feather poking every now and again. But the truth, it's still ours. We just have to have eyes to see it, like Nathaniel's eyes when they were opened to the wonder of Jesus as the Son of God. And if we need a yardstick to figure out which truth is real, Jesus was running way ahead of us. Do you remember all the figurines in our nativity sets? All eyes are set on the baby Jesus. Those people they represent, the shepherds, the wise men, Mary and Joseph, they were gazing on the truth. Their hearts cleaved wide open as God gazed back at them.
and it was good. It was something very good indeed. Do we say amen? Amen. Let us stand as we sing Voices United number 589, Lord, Speak to Me. Let us begin with our prayer of confession. Holy God, we confess that we do not always love our neighbor. Maybe we're offering gray dots. We confess that we have despised others, even to the point of hatred. We confess that we have been hurt by others. We confess that forgiveness and reconciliation at times are just impossible for us. But we know that nothing is impossible in you. We come to you seeking healness, healing and wholeness for us. Help us whenever possible to live in peace with others, to seek reconciliation and healing and forgiveness. For your son came and lived among us, was betrayed and denied, abused and put to death. He rose again and came with the message of peace to those who had denied him and abandoned him. May we walk in his ways. Amen. Nothing is impossible with God. There is no place you can go, no end of the earth you can run, where God cannot find you. There is nothing on earth or beyond death that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are forgiven, you are loved, you are reconciled to God. Go and live with the God, the love of God, and we say amen. Amen. Let us sing together. You may remain seated. If this is our prayer hymn, May We But Wait. And we'll sing this through three times. word knowing our prayer is 
beautiful. Let us take a moment to silently pray for these people um, named before us and those we hold in our hearts. And we begin. Eternal God, you are the maker of us all, and we are your creation. People formed in your image as individuals, as community, formed and fed and furnished with understanding of who you are and of who and whose we are. We worship you today in recognition of your calling, of your communicating, of your caring to invite us to share in your creative and healing work. We are here because we have heard you speak in us and through others. Help us, dear Lord, to ever respond to you and your invitation to grace. And we say, God of all our moments, of all our days and our nights, you speak and you act in the world around us, not only to call all people to you, but also to direct and guide us in the way of healing and wholeness. Awaken us, Lord, to hear what you would say to us. Help us to open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts to your presence. Help us to know when it is your voice we are hearing and when it is our prejudices and desires to which we are paying heed. And we say, Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray that your church may rise up with renewed commitment and answer to your call, that your people may be instruments of your grace and love. We pray for those who consider themselves inadequate and dismiss or avoid your calling in their lives. Please give them a new vision, a vision in which you are their strength and their hope. We pray for those who, in answering your call, must leave the known for the unknown, the oasis for the desert, the comfortable for the uncertain. Grant them courage and steadfast faith. We pray too today, Provider God, for those in want and need, for those of us and of the larger community in, who suffer in body or in soul. Remember before you those we have named and held silently in our hearts. Loving, loving parent, bless us all with an abundant faith, a fruitful ministry, a joyful life. Bless us all and those who gather together to continue the work of Jesus, who came to heal, save, and deliver us all, and who taught us to pray as one family saying, and we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Mother and Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Mike is going to come forward, Mike Hulls, for a minute for Emmanuel. Emmanuel has, uh, Emmanuel United Church faces several challenges. To meet these challenges, we need to find new and radical solutions. To ensure that all voices are heard, Emmanuel has joined with Credence and Company. Credence will support us through a congregational renewal process. Emmanuel is initiating this process to hear from you. Engage in important faith-based conversations. Delight in how God has presented, it has been present through Emmanuel's life. And to listen for God's calling in Emmanuel now. The current process will draw from the learning and outcomes of previous visioning processes. We invite your prayerful engagement in this process. 
This discernment process is being supported by Emmanuel's reference group, Reverend Brenda Torrey, Rob Seamus, Ken Nethercott, Laura Visser, and Amanda Broderick. Credence will deliver sermons and uh, facilitate conversations with the congregations over the next several weeks. Next week will be the first one, January 28th, followed by February 11th, March 3rd, and April 14th. During this time, the congregation will engage in conversation, prayer, and discernment regarding questions of, with which the, the church is wrestling. If you want more information about uh, Credence or to contact them directly, uh, their website and um, email address are on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Beautiful. And now for our time of offering. I dwell upon the goodness in my life. Thank you. I cherish in my heart your gift to me. Thank you. I notice the blessings of life, breath, loving and sharing and i am so very grateful and i respond to your love with this gift today the ways that you can give will be on the screen this morning May the giving of our tithes and offerings to you this day make us bold in following. May it prepare us to give more readily, love more deeply, show mercy and compassion more extravagantly, and seek justice for others courageously. Help us to walk in the steps of the one we follow. In Christ's holy name we pray and we all say, Amen. 
let us join together in singing Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. That is in Voices United number 602. let you know that from verses four to six you ought to watch the screen because I added two extra verses <laughs> I liked them I was listening to it on YouTube and I found the lyrics and I thought oh, there are two stanzas in here that we don't have and I think they're perfect so I'm sorry to Nancy and Mary and <laughs> I can see you looking and Paul all right are we ready before I end and everybody kind of clicks off I'd like to thank the Reverend Roz Vincent Haven for being here and shepherding you in my uh, time of study leave. So I, I thank you. I heard wonderful things. Yes, thank you. I want you to know you go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being right where you are. Christ, who indwells you by the power of the Spirit, wants to do something in and through you. Believe this and go in his grace, his love, his power, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we sing.